And at this point, I think a lot of us can say, we don't have one. There is no company-wide process anymore. Um, you know, tech and testing and all of those different aspects of the world that we're working in right now, they're constantly evolving and they're changing. And having one monolithic process just isn't making as much sense anymore as it used to. So we're going to go through what that looks like today for teams, how you can do that a little bit more efficiently. Um, and this is all based on experiences at my previous two companies where we moved away from those monoliths into having some individual team processes. So first off, a little bit about me. So obviously my name is Bailey Hanna. Um, I'm a Canadian. I've been in testing for the last five years, like uh, Rachel introduced me as. I'm currently working for a company called Desire to Learn in Kitchener. They commonly just go by D2L and also just joined the board of directors for the KWS QA. So again, um, kind of as it said in my bio, I've learned a lot in the last five years through three different companies, lots of what works well and a lot of what does not work well. Um, so I just always love sharing those experiences with the greater testing community. Um, and if you want, my handle on Twitter is just my name. So pretty easy to find. <laughs> so what are we going to talk about today? We're gonna to talk about what individual team processes actually are, what the benefits and risks can be to moving to individual team processes, how to determine if individual processes are a good fit for you, or if you're already in an individual team process kind of company, maybe there's a, some thoughts of where you should move away from it, um, how to evolve to individual team processes, so if you're in a monolith right now, and how to maintain cohesion among teams with individual processes. So starting us off, what are individual team processes? At the very base, individual team processes are created, utilized, and maintained by individual teams instead of a process prescribed at an organizational level. That's kind of your textbook, what you probably already think of for an individual process. But more importantly, individual processes are processes based on the context of a team. And in this case, a lot of people seem to take the context of a team as just kind of the product that you're working on or the project that you're working on, but it's a lot more than that. It's also about the people that you have on your team. So there's definitely aspects of what you're working on that come into play, but there's also everybody on your team has their own experiences, their own skills, their own ideas about what could make your team better. And taking all of those into account is also gonna be important to defining processes that work best for your team. So some examples of individual processes or ceremonies that I've seen on teams that I've been on or that I've worked with, merging before testing, having staging environments, testing in production, automating everything, automating absolutely nothing, having testers, not having testers, having designers on the team, having product considered part of the team, all of these different things are you know, processes that you could add in but they might not work for your team or they could work great for your team. So the benefits and the risks of doing individual processes, like every process or every tool that you could think of um, in, te in tech in general, sorry, uh, there's benefits and there's risks or challenges that you're gonna face. So the benefits to individualized processes. Number one is increased efficiency. This is what every team is going for when they wanna individualize their processes. They've seen that there's gaps in the current process or that there's a ton of overhead that's just not applicable to them and it doesn't make sense for them to be doing certain aspects of it anymore. The other thing is an added sense of ownership for the team. When the team is the one who's making these calls and they're the ones who are in control, it just empowers them to feel you know, more invested in this and they really put the effort into making sure the processes are working. And then there's added trust from the team. So obviously, if you're allowed to do individual processes, there's some kind of buy-in from the company level. So they trust the team to be making these calls. But it also lets the team trust the company more because they know that it's kind of a two-way street. And then it fits the context of the team's focus or project. This is another one of the big ones. This is part of why a lot of teams wanna do this. If you're on a team that is customer facing and critical software, you have way different priorities than an internal facing team that's only actually releasing every couple of months. They're very different things that you're thinking about and there's different aspects that you're gonna to have to consider. 
And the next, like I said, it utilizes team members' individual experiences and skills. So you could have someone coming into your team who has a ton of experience with, say, Cyprus, and they want to use that and try that out as a tool, but all the other teams could be freaked out by it because they've never heard of it. They've never used it before. They like what they're doing. So when you have these individualized processes, you're actually able to do that a little bit easier which leads into greater experimentation. You can actually try those things out. You can try a new tool, a new process, a lot easier when it's kind of confined into your team and then you can experiment, see what works, see what doesn't and share that out wider after the fact, instead of it kind of being an all or nothing of changing your processes right from the start if you're at a company level. And then there's the risks to individualized processes. So there's the risks and their kind of challenges. So most of these can be overcome, but they are things that you need to think about and you need to consider at the very least before you move your team into individualized processes. The first one is the lower or lack of transparency for the company, especially if you've moved from a startup into you know, a medium to large size business. Some of the higher level execs are used to having a good idea of what's going on at a team level. And when you move to individualized processes, you can really lose that. You can even lose that between teams. The next is the lack of tracking for processes. So once you move into these, some teams fall into the trap of nothing gets written down anymore about what your actual process is. And instead you move towards, oh, well, this team member knows that. And then you end up with a single point of failure if that person leaves. The next, especially for large companies, is an increased learning curve to inter-team moves. One of the benefits and things that larger teams like use all the time is that if you're on the same process, it's easy to move your resources around between teams to make sure that your staffing requirements are met. But you're increasing the ramp up time if you have different processes, because it's not just that they have to ramp up on the product anymore. They're also going to have to learn the new team processes. The next one can be confusion on the team around those processes. So say somebody just did an inter-team move or you just hired a brand new individual. If you don't have any kind of process documentation, it can be really confusing about what you're actually doing, um, especially as we all kind of start to slowly break off of agile, but we're still mostly doing agile, but with these little special things, it can be really confusing for new people. The next one is really important if you are in the security industry or if you have government contracts. The risk of lost or missing data during audits. There are a lot of companies with contractual obligations who need to have certain pieces in place. And when you move to individual processes, if you aren't aware of what all of those are right off the bat, it can be really hard to explain when you are missing that later and it could cause severe issues for the company. The next one, and this is the biggest one that I think almost every team struggles with, is a lack of cohesion among your teams. So if you're in a large organization and say there's even just three teams, if you're all doing your own thing, it kind of silos you out even further of like, it's not just you're on your own product anymore. You're also doing your own thing over here with your processes on that product. And it can cause a lack of collaboration between your teams. So. Now that we've gone through the benefits and the risks, how do you know if individual processes are a good fit for your team or your organization? First, we're going to go through the indicators of a potentially bad fit. Number one is those strict contractual obligations resulting in processes that must be adhered to. Again, this is huge if you work in security or government or you're working on government contracts. There are things that you have to do in order to uh, be a be eligible to be used by these companies and it's important to make sure that those are followed. This can be gotten around by you know making sure that you have you have you're aware of all the issues um, but it's just it is a big thing to think about. The next one is very poor communication among teams in the organization. If you're already in the situation where teams aren't collaborating with one another and you're having kind of this breakdown in communication between them Siloing them off further maybe isn't the best step at this point, and it would be important to work on that before you move into individual processes. Next, strict waterfall workflows are in place. We all know that waterfall was you complete this, and then you do this, and then you do this, and then you do this. That doesn't lend itself very well to if one team in the middle starts doing their own thing, it can really cause issues for everyone else. 
The next is a tightly coupled architecture amongst areas of the product. So if you, if team A is completely reliant on team B and team B is completely reliant on team C, you need to have a decent amount of similarity and process across those, or at least an understanding of where in each process you do those handoffs and you do those check-ins. Um, so these can all just be things that you want to think about and at the very least come up with a way to address and work through if you're going to be moving into individualized processes. So indicators of a potentially good fit. Your teams are all working on individual pieces of the product. So if you have one team that's doing authentication and one team that's on new features and you have one team that does like your billing system, that's generally where these are going to be the most effective because you're able to focus in on the context of those teams. If you have teams that are sharing that context piece, it can be harder because you're probably going to need to collaborate and work out a process that works for multiple teams. If you're working, if you have or you're working towards a decoupled architecture, so basically the opposite of a potentially bad fit, if you have the ability to have microservices where if one component goes down, it's not going to negatively impact the others, that's a really good situation where you can work on different processes and know that you're not going to negatively impact your other teams. Next, teams are finding they have a lot of overhead or gaps in their process. If teams are already kind of doing this thing where it's like, okay, well, that process doesn't actually really cover these three other areas that we need to cover. We'll just kind of slide those in where the teams are kind of already doing this covertly. They've already got their own specializations that they've thrown into the mix or there's things in the overall plan that they're already just kind of skipping over, skimming over and being like, yeah, not applicable to us. It's generally an indicator that this could be considered for your company. So. Now that you've decided that it is a good fit and you want to move over towards this, what are you going to do? So in my experience, we broke it down kind of into three different steps, moving from our standardized process into a standard process with specializations, then into static individual processes, and finally into dynamic living individual processes. So moving from a standardized process into a standardized process with specializations, it's all about taking that process and filling in the gaps for your team. So adding in what you need to do um, and less so taking things out. So first you need to define your existing process. Even if everybody thinks they're all on the same page about what it is, it's important at an organizational level to define it and make sure that it's written down as like a company or as like a testing group, whatever the process may be, review it for potential unnecessary steps. If this process was written two years ago, there is a very high chance that certain aspects of it aren't even applicable anymore. Your software has probably evolved past the point. Next, review it within your teams. So even if say it's a testing process and you're the only tester on your team, it's still important to bring that back, go over it with your team, and you'd be surprised that they're probably going to also have recommendations for things that they would like to see added into it or issues that they could see with it in your team's context. That's where you're gonna define the gaps in the process for your team. So figure out what this is missing and what you need to cover in order to feel confident in your product. And then document and define those specializations. So those are the additions that you're putting into the system. And it's important to document them so that A, like we said, new team members know, but also just so that you know over time when these decisions got made. So now that you've got your specializations, you want to move to having a static individual process. So you're going to review your existing process and the specializations because you're probably doing this a couple months later. You're probably not doing it like the next day. And then the biggest thing for this is you're going to take out what doesn't make sense. So you're going to review for overhead on your team. What are you doing at this point that just isn't applicable, be it that your team isn't actually releasing to customers or your internal only, or it's asking for audit data that your team doesn't even collect, things like that that you can remove in order to make it more efficient. Discuss potential changes based on the context of your team. Again, if you're doing this a few months down the road, your team might have changed. There could be new people. You could be going in a new direction. All of these things are really important to think about. Review for gaps and adjust to fill them. Basically the same as what you did in the last process. And document your team's process and share it publicly. Once you have teams moving into these static individual processes, it's so important that you can see that 
as a member of another team. You want to be able to share this. You want to share what's working, what's not working, and make sure that you can also get that information from other teams when you need it. And then moving on from static over into dynamic, which is where I think we all want to be. So review your existing process on a regular cadence for gaps and overheads. Uh, I suggest starting with at least quarterly and then moving it down from there. My team at this point, for example, we do it during retros. It's just kind of something that we chat about and figure out if there's anything we want to change. We experiment with new processes and document your results. So if you're going to try out a new tool or you're going to say, uh, we're changing retros from every two weeks to once every two months, and we're going to see how it goes. Making sure that you document why you wanted to do that and what your results are when you did is so important because it helps new team members coming in and wondering what's going on. It helps if you're sharing this information with another team instead of, you know, having to walk through it with them. You can just point them to your docs. It's just a lot easier for teams. And then update your documentation of your team's process, again, to share it out sharing those updates of your process with the organization. So if you're saving that document, if you've changed anything in it, that's a really good trigger to share that information more widely with your team. And I'll go over some ways to do that um, in our next slides. And then the last thing is to encourage questions or comments to your updated processes. Your team might have thought that they made the best decision in the world and somebody in another part of the organization could have information and they'll be like, hey, I know you think this is great, but in six months, your performance is going to be terrible. Or, hey, you guys changed this. You know that's a security requirement, right? And that we can't pass this without it. All of those things need to be considered as well. So that's why sharing it out is so important. So the big thing, how to maintain cohesion with individual processes. This is all about how to keep your organization aligned while all of your teams are doing their own thing. Number one, I think I've said it enough throughout this talk that it shouldn't surprise you. Document the process. Make sure you have documentation on what is going on and make sure they're le living documents. They aren't just, you know, stale and they're three years old and someone's like, eh, I think that's kind of right. Make sure that you're reviewing them often as a team. Like I said, starting with quarterly is a great idea. And then use these as your source of truth for processes and changes. If someone's like, I want to change our retro cadence, you can be like, okay, from what? And if someone's like, oh, we've been doing them every two weeks, but your like documents say four, you should be doing them every four. And if they aren't doing, if you're not doing that, you need to update them. They need to be considered accurate. And the last thing, again, I think I've harped on it enough, make sure that they're publicly available. Make sure that other teams are able to get this information and can also learn from what you're doing. Next is meet with communities of practice. I feel like a lot of people are probably already doing this, but it's an open forum for sharing knowledge and ideas between teams. Um, my suggestion and the way that we've always done it is to have them orient around a role, but not be um, refined, like, sorry, restricted to that role. So if you have like a testing community of practice, it's going to be of the most interest to the testers. But don't limit it and say that, you know, developers or designers or product can't join because they might have questions. They could be on a team without a tester at this point, or they could just be on a team with very junior testers and they like need advice on how to guide them. All of these things um, are very important and it's good to get those other opinions coming in. And the big thing is discuss wins and losses. So we always want to talk about what went well and what's working great for our team, but it is just as important to talk about what went wrong and why it went wrong. If we can tell you that we tried Cypress and here's why it didn't work because of the legacy code and blah, 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 we save another team three weeks, three weeks of effort in the future from going and trying the same thing and learning the exact lesson that we already did. And the last one is to allow space and time for shadowing make sure that you have time to join in on the ceremonies and processes of another team. You know, sit with somebody for a day, obviously a bit harder during COVID, but you know, Zoom rooms can last for a long time. And you can invite them to share their experiences with your team. You know, come in, tell us how yours is going. Tell us about things that you've learned just in case people aren't checking these docs. It just helps to, for people to get this better sense of under, an understanding of what's going on. You can learn a lot from other people in different areas of your product. And then again, so pair up and learn from one another. 
Don't make it a one-way street where it's just one person explaining everything to another. Make sure that you have an open forum so that you can really discuss things together. So wrapping it all up, individualized processes can reduce overhead, fill in gaps, and increase the efficiency of teams, but they require work. They aren't a silver bullet. They're not just going to make everything more efficient. They're going to take a lot of work, especially to keep your company and your organization all on the same page. So next steps, if you're working towards individual processes, number one, determine what your current org processes are. This is a big one. Or if you're already somewhere in the middle of this, define what your processes are on your team right now and write them down and make sure that you're all on the same page about it. Determine if individual processes are a good fit for you. Is this what's going to work best? Or perhaps it's not based on the context of your organization. Iteratively work towards them. Don't try and jump all the way into having dynamic processes in a single day because it's probably going to get confusing for everybody. And then you're just going to assume it doesn't work. Four, maintain, like work to maintain the cohesion among the teams in your organization. So put that effort in, even if you're noticing it start to slip, all it really takes is one person kind of pushing that again and teams will get back to, you know, sharing with, an, with each other. And then last one is share your experiences, not just, you know, within your organization, don't just share them with other teams, but just in general, share them with the wider testing community. I'm going to be posting my blog post uh, to go along with this in the next week or so. And the number one thing I'm encouraging is for people to share the challenges that they've had with this in the comments so that other people can learn from them and just make sure that we're all, you know, working towards a better way of having these individual processes. And that's it. So thanks for coming. And there's my Twitter and my website address. Again, the blog hopefully will be up in the next week, but we'll see how fast I get that done. Thanks a bunch, Bailey. Do we have questions? Uh, raise your cards or put in the chat green, yellow, red. I think that's a green one. Go ahead, Mark. I also think it's green. I'm one of those red, green, colorblind people who, I have two stickers and they're not the same color. I know that. <laughs> so, <laughs> so when, um, Bailey, that was really good. Two of the things I'm going to take away I really liked was the communities of practice and the shadowing another team. But um, um, you described the reverse of what I'm going through. So I joined my new company back in December, and they were smaller um, at one time, and it was easy to, to not have um, corporate-wide processes. The teams could do what worked for them. We are now growing, and we became public, and we'll be more scrutiny and we are trying to introduce processes. So you're taking teams who had free will, so to speak, and getting them to now adopt processes. Do you have, have you experienced that? Anything specific like you would warn or? Yeah, um, I mean, I think kind of the biggest thing is get those teams right now to write down what their processes are. There's probably more overlap than people are thinking that there is. And then you can use that overlap as your like kind of first shot at an org wide process. So if, you know, every team is doing agile and every team has a tester or every team doesn't have a tester in the devs test, whatever it might be, you can use that as a jumping off point and then almost do it again in the reverse of look at that and say, okay, so, if we just use the commonalities, what gaps are we missing as like a product? And then you can start to fill those in, you know, from the individual teams. And there could be, you could end up, um, I'd say probably most likely at the like base process with specializations. Each team's probably still going to have one or two things that are specific to them, but you can get that base sorted out just from, you know, what's overlapping between all of your teams at this point. Do I get to do this to follow up? Yes, yes. go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so your team, so you're, when you say base, maybe like a framework, like have your framework in place and kind of work. Well, if it's agile, we do whole team quality. There's enough things that are, you know, yeah. common. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So for ours, like our base process was basically, here's all the things you have to do. And then the specializations became, and then this team also wants to do this and this and this. So it was just like, here's kind of like what our overall process was. And then people just kind of split off from there. They were like, I'll keep these three things. 
months. Yeah. But if you're moving towards like you want to have that unified process, uh, the overlap is a great place to start. And then making sure that, you know, if you're having like these contracts coming in, you add into that and say, here's what our requirements are now. Cool, thanks for taking notes.